what's going down. We are out here. South Bay Connects Podcast. Eli Lopez. Leave a mark. Big Eddie in the house. We got High Sunday. Choo! It's going down. Holla at you, boy. We're going to get this thing started. <laughs> we wanted to uh, give a warm welcome to one of our guests here. Uh, it would literally take the entire podcast if I were to give... Uh, our guest, Dr. Omir Dean, the proper introduction, uh, because there's just so many layers to you, doctor. I'll, I'll get, cut it yeah. pretty short. Uh, first, I'll bring up what your specialty is. It's a gastroenterology. Gastroenterologists diagnose and treat problems of the esophagus, stomach, pancreas, gallbladder, liver, and intestines. Common conditions seen by gastrologists include swallowing problems, inflammatory bowel disease, and fatty liver disease. That's just a very surface introduction as to what you do. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Welcome aboard. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And joining us is Eddie from Leave a Mark and Ike Hi Sunday. Hey, hey. Welcome, gentlemen. <laughs> so we have a doctor in the house. <laughs> That's right. <We> thank you. Do. Thank you so much for joining us. We, hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you. We are well aware of how busy you must be. So for us, it means definitely the world. And on behalf of our South Bay community, we'd like to thank you for taking the time uh, to talk to us, chat to us. Uh, you know, we'll uh, keep it nice and cordial. <laughs> this isn't an attack or any kind of crazy questions. We're just happy to have you. And we'll definitely talk about some of our journey together and some of the things that yeah, you're involved absolutely. in. And uh, you're involved in a lot of things. So like I said, we're uh, going to keep it brief because it would take probably a week long podcast to uh, get to cover everything that you're uh, that you've accomplished. We're very proud of you. That. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a uh, it's it's a lot when you stop and think about stuff. But, you know, much like you, you find stuff in the community needs. People have needs. There's things that come up. You feel like you can help. And if you're the kind of person that likes to step in and try to do what you can, it's hard to decide where you draw that line. You keep getting sucked into more and more. And so for me, you know, I think just within healthcare, uh, within the local community, the needs of people in the area, you just try to kind of do what you can, do your part in your community. And that's actually where we bonded um, is talking about that. And the same thing that you're doing for the people in the community. There's endless lives that you've touched in the South Bay, especially in Torrance. Um, and uh, that's just something that I look up to. And I think a lot of the younger kids growing up, that's what we want. We want them to look at that be a little less self-absorbed and a little more community driven. That's one of the things that strengthens communities. And, and uh, we've uh, been knowing each other for some time now. Uh, you work very close by uh, Rolling Hills. What, what other hospitals do you, are you associated with? So I'm at, um, uh, and thank you, by the way, for that kind of introduction. This is, uh, so my specialty is specifically in clinical nutrition. And so that involves the whole spectrum of obesity, bariatrics, all the way down to severe malnutrition. Um, anything that affects your digestion, absorption, um, you know, whether you can eat, whether you can't eat, if we need to do it through tubes, if we need to do it through the IV, um, you know, bowel obstructions, anything nutrition related is really under my, my specialty. Um, so my main, uh, you know, my practice is located in Rolling Hills Estates, but uh, I travel quite a bit to a few other hospitals in the area, Torrance Memorial, Little Company of Mary in the South Bay. Um, I also go to some of the uh, post-acute hospitals, kindred hospitals, um, where a lot of the long-term patients are, a lot of them on ventilators, sometimes mm. for life. And so uh, I see patients there. And then we've got a uh, an urgent care on PCH, actually, not too far from here, Peninsula Urgent Care in Torrance. Um, and so we just celebrated our one year anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Um, with, the, with the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> that, was great. that was congratulations. great. Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot going on. A lot going on. Yeah, yeah you <laughs> slipped that in. <laughs> oh, man, that was a, that's a very pleasant Were you always surprise. like this? Or when, when did you like um, saw that path that you were like, you know what, I want to help people? You know, it's, I think about that a lot because it's difficult to pinpoint any one specific thing. But I think one thing that we talked about that we related on is um, being, being the child of immigrants had a lot to do with it. 
Um, and that's something that I think a lot of times gets lost that, um, if you, and I explain this to my kids a lot because they're not the children of immigrants. And so sometimes I need to remind them to work hard, um, to leave your country, to leave your community and your comfort zone, your language, your culture, your friends, and to just uproot and move to a new country takes a lot. It is not something that we should take lightly as Americans. Um, and I think sometimes we do, and I think it we lose a little bit of that empathy for what it takes for people to do that. Number one, you have to be driven out. Sometimes things are so bad that you have to leave. And sometimes you're a dreamer and you want a better life and you want your children to be able to achieve things that you have not been able to achieve and have opportunities that you weren't able to have. And the reason I bring that up is because there's a drive and grit and work ethic that just comes part and parcel with that mentality. And that's why you see people who come here from other countries work so hard and self-sacrifice and scrape pennies together and make magic happen. And as children, I, I was born here, I was born in Detroit. Um, you see that and you can't help but intertwine that mentality in your life, partially just from seeing it and partially because, let's face it, our parents were not embarrassed to put their foot up our butts and be like, <laughs> I didn't nice come here. <laughs> I didn't come here for you to sit around playing Nintendo or playing whatever. I came here and I did all this and I expect you to yeah. do more. Right. And so, uh, and, and of course we heard that growing up, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, I watched my parents work hard and, you know, uh, build their first house. They, they built a house, they saved up. Um, and, um, that happened when I was in high school. Um, and left an impression on you. Yeah, it did. And, you know, they volunteered at the local mosque. They helped out in the community. They did all kinds of things in our neighborhood. And, um, I guess that sticks with you. So that just through examples, you. it wasn't yeah. necessarily that they were coaching you. It was just the way they were. Yeah, it was, I think the way they were and the rules that they set for mm. us and then kind of seeing them and you don't want to disappoint them. Yeah. And so when you're younger, you're kind of just trying to do what you think you have to do. And, um, and as you get older and you start understanding the reasoning behind it and the rationale, a lot of times it just turns into who you are and, and your drive. That immigrant you know? mentality, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to waste a moment. I didn't yeah. want to let opportunities go. I wanted to learn as much as I could. Yes. I wanted to do as much as I could and, you know. Uh, be a little adventurous, and uh, that's what led me to to do the, the things in healthcare, but also the things for the in the community. Yeah, that's really nice. Do you have siblings? I do. I have uh, a brother who's two and a half years younger than me, and then I have a sister who's two years younger than him. Oh, okay. And they're both in the Midwest. So I was born in Detroit. I grew up in Kansas City, right outside Kansas City in Independence, Missouri. And uh, my brother is there. Um, my parents are there. My sister is in St. Louis, about four hours away. I'm the only one out here out west. Uh, are they jealous of the weather? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right I mean, now, those they places are. are. They definitely are. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You sent them pictures? I did. I also, <laughs> I'll send them palm tree pictures, you know, the sun shining. I actually, it's funny you mentioned that. A good friend of mine was just on the phone with me as I was driving over here, and he's. Uh, he was out here visiting and he just flew back. He's in Baltimore. And um, he was just telling me, he's like, man, enjoy that weather out there. It's snowing out here. It's cold. You know, <laughs> I'm like, hey, sounds like you need to move out to L.A. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we definitely live we in could, a... We could use another one of you. Right. <laughs> hey, yeah. are, are your siblings also in medicine? Um, my sister is a nurse okay. and my brother is, uh, he works for the government. He's in the U S postal service. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so they're all, they were, they were all, um, had the, uh, had that example of your parents, huh? And they were just, they did the same as you. They followed their own path. I think, right? yeah, I think just growing up at home and kind of that whole experience, it's just, you're familiar with it. It's, it's a mm -hmm. way of life. It's a way of thinking yeah. about others and about your life and. Uh, it's not exclusive to being an immigrant, but I think yeah. that that's kind of a common thread that I tend to find when I talk to people. And that was something that was common for us. I mean, that's how we connected. Yeah. Being from so, such different backgrounds, we still were able to connect because we had very similar upbringing as far as 
you know, for you, it was maybe a foot. For me, it was a chancla. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm very familiar with the chancla. <laughs> <Chancla. laughs> so. I got the scars to prove it. <laughs> Good year tires at the back because that's how they used to do the soles. Oh, man. It was the shoes, man. My mom would kill me for telling this story, <laughs> but I'm going to tell it anyway. Okay. So you've probably experienced this. Like, you do something wrong, you know it's wrong. Mom would call me. She would send me to go pick up the weapon of choice, <laughs> bring it. It was often a slipper or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was a little, you know, like, you know what's coming. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why they thought that that was okay. Like that. <laughs> I mean, it was a mental, mental, it had a mental aspect to it. It was tor mental torture. It, it, was less, physical. it was less physical. <laughs> yeah. It was more oh, about. 100%. Look, you, you did something wrong. You yeah. know, you did something wrong. You know, there's consequences. There's consequences. You just got you, 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 know. you know, the the biggest thing that I think that taught me was accountability. Right. Because I had time to walk to get, for, for me, it was the belt. Go bring me the belt. Mm. I had to go get a belt, you know, and I'm looking for the thinnest one. <laughs> <laughs> Taking my time. <laughs> and then, you know, I bring it back. And yeah, but it taught me accountability. Those little steps. And then, that, you know, my mom was like, okay, well, at least you're obedient. You're admitting that you were wrong. You didn't go into some sort of a soliloquy about your innocence. And <laughs> so that just made it worse. It did. Yeah. It always, <laughs> always did. Let's yeah. face it. Oh man. So um, what, what are some of your hobbies? I mean, you, you are so involved in pra the practice of medicine and the community. Do you have time off? Do you have hobbies that you, that you're um, um, to share? So I, I do work seven days a week. Um, I work every day. Um, not every day is super long. Um, but um, I'm a car guy. I like cars. Um, and so uh, I like to drive. I'll go on a drive. I think it's, it's good to clear my head. Sometimes I'll go to the racetrack and, and drive, you know, at least a couple times a year, drive some cars there. And that's, that's kind of what I like to do when I'm unwinding. Hmm. Um, but that I'm having, I'm having a little trouble finding time to do those types of things. <laughs> do you find that your career is so fulfilling that it kind of fills in that hobby gap where you, yeah, to, to a large degree. I think especially being involved with, you know, the L.A. County Medical Association, uh, where I'm, I'm immediate past president now. Um, but I've been on the board for years and the executive committee. It's a great group of people doing amazing work uh, within the House of Medicine, as we call it, um, trying to advocate for physicians and for the physician patient relationship. Um, so uh, a lot of time is devoted to that, and I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, so there's a lot of kind of offshoots of that little groups and things that form mm -hmm. that, you know, you're trying to help, you know, we do all kinds of things outdoors during the pandemic. We went and handed out PPE to practices that didn't have PPE. Remember there was that whole time where there was a severe shortage. Yeah. And so we were able to, to procure, um, PPE and special equipment and masks and things like that. And then we were able to kind of divvy it up amongst practices because it's hard for them to get it. You know, sometimes yeah. the big health organizations have a little bit of a monopoly sometimes, or they have, they have more negotiating power. And so they're able to get it. But uh, a lot of the practice, uh, you know, people that are in private practice aren't able to get it. So we were trying to kind of bridge that gap. Um, That's just an example. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, always, it's always predicated to something to do with your helping people, right? That's your hobby. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the hope. That's yeah, the that's hope, that. you know, that's what you, you try know, to do. And, and you bring out something very, uh, very important. And I, I like to take this time to recognize that because you do work seven days a week. Uh, the, the days are short, but there was a time not that long ago where you were talking about earlier that where the world stood still, that you your hours were really, really long. I remember uh, when we would meet up for your haircut, you just the look on your face was of exhaustion. And I just wanted to say thank you because I know that you had to sacrifice time away from your family to help so many of the families in our community. These are all South Bay families that we're, we're seeing. And uh, that I know that took a toll. And I just uh, want to acknowledge your time, your sacrifice and, and your bravery. Uh, because to be able to combat, you know, what was in front of you was challenging and I'm sure it was scary. I know it was scary for me and I was nowhere near in the places that you were. So I just wanted to say thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, this is, you know, one of the things with, uh, of course, with COVID, we forget, I forget when you look back at the beginning, it was a, uh, it was a scary time. 
because we didn't know what we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. We knew it was a deadly virus at the time. It has since mutated and it's less deadly now. But at that time, there was question about how it spread and how contagious and who's going to die from it, who's not. We couldn't really put our finger on where it was going to go. You couldn't, you couldn't reliably say, oh, this elderly patient no data. is not going to do yeah. well. This young patient's going to do great because sometimes you were humbled. Um, and then, you know, especially early on where not everybody had access, there were a lot of uh, free clinics that we set up throughout the city. Um, uh, you know, there's one of my uh, good friends who's currently the president after me, the LA County Medical Association, uh, Dr. Jerry Abraham. He specializes in street medicine. And so amongst the homeless population in the inner city, I mean, this is where his work is focused. And so he saw a whole aspect of it that the rest of us didn't Whoa. see. And so he's got stories. You know, I went out Whoa. to see him a few times uh, downtown. Um, and, you know, he's people like this just do phenomenal work. You know, they're unsung heroes. You know, uh, I'm grateful to work amongst them and, and uh, you know, to learn from people. And we had a lot of cross cross contamination, we say. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've got Dr. Humor. I've got yeah. cousins, I love it. You know, my cousins and people in, in medicine and healthcare across the country. We were we did Zoom calls, we did uh phone conversations, like group phone conversations, even where we're talking about what are you doing out there and how much of this are you seeing? And are you guys using ventilators the way we are? And are you guys doing, you know, and so we went through the whole trying to pick up and learn what are they doing in New York? What are they doing in the Midwest? Wow. And what, what strain of virus are you guys seeing? And so it was, it's weird, but in a way it brought us close together because we were able to kind of pick each other's brains and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And it kind of brought this cohesive, you know. And it um, almost needed something of that magnitude, right? To bring everybody together. And it's almost like the behind the scenes that nobody ever know. Never, the, the regular public didn't know. Right. That you were going through all this and, and how much work you actually put in to, for us. And we didn't, we didn't even hear it. Yeah, it was, uh, it, honestly, we were driven by fear. And we were driven, you know, you just kind of do the best you can. We, uh, I remember we didn't know how contagious it was or does it linger on your clothes? And if I touch this can, is it going to be on the can? Yeah. And, and then for how long? And they're like, oh, 15 minutes, somebody could come <laughs> along and they're dead. Like, you know. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, we would get home from work and, it, you know, you're taking off your clothes in the garage and you're like throwing in the washer. Wow. You're going in to, to take a shower before you wow. see your family. You know, we had a couple babies in the family that I just didn't touch and didn't go near for a while. Um, you know, uh, parents, limited contact with parents because we're like, well, they're elderly and is this going to be a good idea? And just, you know, a hug and a kiss could could mean that they're infected. and so. So I think the hardest time was when we were dealing with that. We're seeing a lot of death in the hospitals. Um, we don't know if I'm infected, if I'm going to get it. Could this one, could there be a leak in the PPE? I mean, these are all things that we're all dealing with. Yeah. You know, our nurses uh, in the hospitals who are going into these rooms. And they're, you have to, you, when you're taking care of a patient, right, yeah. you're going in there when they have to go to the bathroom to give them meds, to suction, to, you know, do all these things. And so all of these people that were in, on the front lines, um, you know, uh, much more exposure than, than me. Um, you know, these are, these are people that I think are, are heroes. And then mm -hmm. what we saw, what I think was really heartwarming was the response from the community in the South Bay, right? Because we're doing all this work and we're in the hospitals and we're dealing with all of this. Meanwhile, businesses are suffering, right? Restaurants are shutting down, stores are shutting down. And despite that, we had local stores and restaurants delivering free food and free supplies to the hospital because they just wanted to let us know that we appreciate all of our healthcare workers and everybody on the front lines. Uh, and that meant a lot. Okay. It meant a lot. And this, these are the types of things that you wish, God forbid, it never happens again. Yeah. Um, but the fact that it did happen and, and the upside that you have to focus on of how it brought people together, I think was, so I think was phenomenal. I thought I'm it was phenomenal. So glad. Yeah. Wow. It, it was, uh, 
there was a lot of challenges, but there were so many beautiful moments mm -hmm. because of it that were brought by it. Uh, the community effort, the resourcefulness that the community became. I mean, it just brought everybody together. And, you know, you being behind the scenes was, was you had a whole nother perspective. I mean, I, I didn't even think that you would be calling other people to see what, what their, what, you know, what their experience is and so forth. I mean, everyone was just reaching for information and, uh, and thank you for all the, all the people that you, you've helped. I mean, it's, like you said, I, I don't want it to go back. You know, no, nobody wants to, to live yeah. like that. I mean, uh, a lot of the, that, that, but it showed how beautiful our South Bay community truly is too. You and know? we needed, not that we needed a pandemic, but we needed that. I that think, reason, yeah. you know, I mean, look at, look at the stuff that you did. I mean, so I'm going to call you out. <laughs> <laughs> I've had patients who couldn't leave home that Eli volunteered to go and, and take care of them and do haircuts and things like that for yeah. no hesitation. No, I didn't have to convince. I was, I was prepared. To try to be like, listen, man, yes. come on, we're think of the people, Eli, have a heart for God. once, right? I, I didn't have to do any of that. I just, I just asked. Yeah. And he said, yeah, of course. Yeah. He said, of course. When? That's, that's Let me know when. That's a great gesture, really. I, I think you when know? he told me that he did that, I was like, you know, obviously I didn't tell him because we're guys, right? But <laughs> deep inside, I was like, Dan, that's, that's something really generous and really right. nice to do, like uh, the kindness of your heart. like. You're going the time, the gas, the, you know, the labor and you still, you know, it, because it's, it really is the right thing to do. It really is the right thing to do. And we should all have that same resolve when it comes down to helping people. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, that's the beauty of, of picking right associates or right, or right connections, because the right connection can inspire you, can, can give you these thoughts. Like, like, you know, we're very like-minded, you know, he acknowledges that was the right thing to do. We know that that was nice to do <clears throat> but when you have that support group and of people also encouraging you oh it just makes it so much easier and then that encourages the next person that action may encourage another action and you know and so on and so forth and that's really what it's about i mean i how can i tell you no doc i mean the, <laughs> the countless people that so you've nice. helped <laughs> i mean you, you asked me for one person <laughs> and then you know and I you would have been quick. Grateful. You would have been next level jerk if you <laughs> said no. If you would have took a oh man! But, uh, <laughs> you know, when the doctor calls, he was like, "What's the word?" No, I'm kidding. Uh, I mean, you it, know, this is infectious. You do good things, do good things for people, expecting nothing in return, and you don't realize it. You don't see it. It perpetuates. People do that. They do it in their lives. They do it around other people. They do it with their families. Kindness spreads. And I think that's, we're going into pol political season, right? Yeah. <laughs> that is the message that we need Kindness is to remember spreads. that we need to be kind and empathetic and think about others. And we don't always understand the story the way we think we understand it. We don't know the full story, the background. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important. Just assume other people are struggling. Oh, Just because really everybody nice. looks good. I, I tell my yeah. kids this, you open up Instagram, you look at, Facebook or whatever, and looks like the whole world. Everybody's a millionaire. Everyone's, <laughs> everyone's a baller. Yeah. Everyone's enjoying life. Yeah. Everyone's sipping Mai Tais. And, yeah. You know, and I'm like, am I the only idiot like, working? <laughs> am I the only, right? I should go somewhere. I should do something, yeah. right? Um, but, but it's sending the wrong message. And I, I actually think that, I'm, I'm making a blanket statement, I actually think that the more people put on this this um, facade of how wonderful and amazing things are, I think the more they're struggling inside. I think mm. that that's the, that's if like you a shield. If you have to show everybody these types of things, and we're all guilty of it, yeah. um, you're really hiding your struggles. And it's better to, I think it's more meaningful to go to a friend and say, hey, look, I'm struggling with this. Have this ever happened to you? Or you, you know, how do you deal with this? Yeah. And to talk it through, I think that that's far more fruitful than just behaving like everything's fine and swallowing whatever difficulties you're going through. And like you said earlier, it will make a stronger connection too when you share those type of things with That's your, when people bond. Yeah. Think about it. Wars, soldiers, yeah. brothers for life, right? In medicine, yeah. we go through residency, fellowship, and training. And, you know, the people that I trained with and went to school with, we talk to this day. We live on opposite corners of the country, but we talk, we joke, and we pick up like, like nothing's changed. 
Um, and I'm sure it's the same with you guys, the guys that you grow up with, that you go through hard times with family yeah. members. Those are the people that you have this unbreakable bond with. Imagine if we could do that with the community at large. That's the, that's really the goal of, of this podcast is, uh, it's not to showcase any lifestyle or anything like that. We really wanted to showcase individuals that are actually doing things for the community, positive things for the community, unifying things for the community. And, uh, we've, Definitely found one in you, and uh, to not to revert too far, um, one of those connections. The reason why we bonded so much is because I shared one of my struggles, and I think one of those struggles is really a lot of people's struggles. You know, um, we all fight those numbers, those LB numbers, <laughs> those pounds. You gain up on us sometimes. We gain a little bit of weight. Uh, I was concerned. I brought my concerns to you, and. Uh, so just stop eating. You like simple. <laughs> right. It was easy. It was All right, solution. done. Yeah. And then I sent him my bill. Yeah. No, he couldn't eat after that. I <laughs> could afford it. Um, yeah, that that journey has become uh, quite a journey, and I'm I'm grateful because um, you were always open to. You know, you come to get a haircut to relax. You have very little time to relax and you're relaxing. But at the same time, you know, I'm like, man, I mean, who do I ask this, this gentleman here? He's an expert in nutrition. He's probably a good person to ask this. And <laughs> so I would I would share my journey at the yeah. time, whether it was a, a fasting or a, whatever it was. You know, my approach was at the time and you were so, so, uh, so concerned, you know, with with my well-being. And it really came across as very genuine and uh, not once were you perturbed that I interrupted your, your peaceful haircut and, you know, your relaxing time, you're right away like, well, you know what, make sure that uh, I remember very clearly you told me if you're going to fast, um, make sure that you take a weekend off. Don't do it just all the time. That's right. Otherwise it, it stops the benefit. Right. Some Paul said, okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's uh. so nutrition is a, I mean, the reason that, this is the specialty that I chose is because it's always been forefront for me. I was overweight as a child. Um, I struggled with, with my weight. Um, I got into high school and decided I've got to lose weight. And so I went on this journey of kind of trying different diets and started working out and really kind of watched the weight come off. And it was just, it was something that to me was my greatest accomplishment to date. Um, and I wanted to learn about it and I wanted to figure out how I can help other people with it. And so that led me down the journey of, you know, digestive disease and, and nutrition and, and the things that can be done and the new latest, greatest medications that we have now. Um, but ultimately it is less to do with food and more to do with our lifestyles. Uh, I, I would say our way of life the way we think about food, the way we relate to food in this country. Um, and through a lot of my travels, I've traveled a lot of places in the world. Um, it has only reinforced that. Um, and, you know, I, I'm guilty of it myself. We don't always practice what we preach. But I think if I were going to dish it out to Americans, um, I would say that we have such an abundance of food and so many options that we don't think of it as a finite resource. We don't think of food as, you know, my mom used to say there's a difference between eating to live and living to eat. <laughs> she would always tell me that. And, uh, and it's absolutely true. You know, um, we've now gotten to the point where so much of what we eat is artificial. It's not natural. It's not the way that it grows on the earth. Um, we hyper concentrate flavors, which, you know, a lot of people don't know if you eat something that's orange flavored, that is like orange flavoring to the power of a hundred injected into this to make it taste like orange and to be sweet. And that has a very addictive property, mm. you know, um, and we do that with everything. It's funny um, you say that. I actually, I, I, I came to the realization that I, I think I'm addicted to sugar. Because I would eat, there would be times where I'll uh, consume something uh, sugary, and then I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna stop. And I would crave it even after a meal. I'm like, I'm full. Right. Like, why do I want this sweet? Like, like, am I like 
it just starts really like mentally starts thinking about it. You're like, am I? Are we? Yes, we are. We all are. And um, it's to make a harsh comparison, uh, you know how a lot of drugs are laced with fentanyl, for example. Yes. And people take other drugs. They don't realize that it's laced with fentanyl. Yeah. Next thing you know, cut, yeah. right? Um, it's similar like that with sugar with us. And this has been since the 80s for sure. And it's just been compounding and getting worse. Um, and so the foods that we eat, there's hidden sugars. Sugar absolutely makes food more addictive. Because when you take in sugar in any form, there's an insulin response. And that insulin response comes up in reaction to that sugar so you can metabolize it or begin to metabolize it. But then that insulin falls. And that falling of insulin makes you crave more sugar. Cool. So and you want to keep that high, the, the, the sugar high, I guess, right? The insulin right. high. And you don't realize it. Right. And so there's multiple studies looking at this. So, so the goal should be to keep your insulin levels as low as possible. Right. At all time. At all times. I mean, you look at, let's use diabetes as an example. Mm -hmm. When you're diabetic, you, you are insulin resistant. It doesn't always mean your body's not producing insulin, right? There's different types of diabetes, but even though you're producing insulin, you're resistant to it. So now your body's making this much insulin, your body doesn't even recognize that there's any insulin there. It takes you this much insulin now to get the job done, right? So what happens with diabetics over time? Do they get thinner or fatter with time? Do they get less or more resistant with time, right? These are things that we're seeing in front of us, yeah. right? Up until recently, and I would argue even today, a lot of medicine is focused on the symptom rather than the cause. Yes. So we will treat diabetics by giving them insulin, insulin. Yeah. right? Which I understand in the short term is necessary, but what we're really doing is perpetuating the problem, right? Your body is, your pancreas is not able to make the amount of insulin that you now require to metabolize the glucose. So I'm going to inject more insulin into you, right? And then the number comes down, the glucose number comes down and we pat ourselves on the back because oh, we're doing a great wow. job. Uh, so not even, don't fix the issue, just the symptoms, just put a bandaid on it almost, right? Because right. they never really address the core problem. And it's not a, um, it's not done on purpose with any evil intent. I think we're genuinely, I think as physicians, we're trying to do the best we can. Um, but I think that the harder conversation is to address Where's all the sugar coming from? Why is it in our diet? Mm -hmm. Why are we eating this way? Why are we eating so much refined food and foods of convenience rather than wholesome natural foods? Um, and we're all guilty of it, right? Um, but unless we address that, it's hard to kind of get to the root cause of the problem. Um, so in any case, so sugar is injected into all these foods. It happened around the time, uh, probably accelerated around the time where Fat was vilified. You remember when we were growing up? Cholesterol. Fat-free, yeah, fat-free, yeah. you know, jelly beans and naturally fat-free food. <laughs> so, Organic. Yeah. So and there was a time as a kid where I was like, oh, this is fat-free. Yeah. Chomp, 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 it's chomp, healthy. right? Yeah. Um, uh, where really that was the sugar was the problem and it was never the fat. Um, so fat isn't the issue. There are types of fat now yeah. that are unhealthy. Um, a lot of the seed oils canola, corn, sunflower, soybean oil, all of these vegetable oils are actually very toxic um, because our body doesn't metabolize them the way that the bottle says it does. They're very unstable and it doesn't take much for those bonds to break and then they become trans fat once you ingest them. Um, again, started with good intentions. They're unsaturated. Wow. It looks good. Right. Right. Um, and a lot of the things that are being vilified are things like meat, red meat, stuff like that. I would argue, and I'm, you know, this is controversial, but I would argue that it's not the red meat that's the problem. It's the way that red meat is cultivated. So if you're feeding cows corn and soy and beans and grains when they should be eating grass, then yes, it's going to alter their hormonal composition and lipid composition. And then when we eat that, it's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Right. Um, and the ones that are fed gr grass, we want it to be natural grass, right? But if you're over fertilizing and over cultivating the ground 
to grow 10 times the amount of grass in this much space that would normally grow there. You have volume, you don't have nutrient density in that soil. There's only so much that a soil uh, that the soil can sustain. So by doing all these things, we're seeing the downstream effects. But then when it comes time to kind of blaming the root of the problem, we're like, it's uh, it's them and it's it's sugar and you know and the truth never comes out yeah well business in business it's difficult because image is everything yeah. and um and so who's going to take the blame you know the dairy farmers got to do what they got to do they got to create the demand for milk is there they have mm -hmm. to meet it the meat demand is there and if all the other dairy farmers are doing something I say dairy farmers, my family, both sides of my family come from dairy farms. Oh, okay. They were dairy farmers uh, in Pakistan, which is where they came from. Um, so, so yeah, so it's a, it's a complex issue, but I think at a, at a personal level, what we can do, and we, we have seen this, is that the market will shift where consumer demand lies. If enough of us say okay. we want wholesome grass-fed meat, we are not going to buy, buy yeah. stuff that's just been grazed incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I think that the market will shift and we're seeing that. I mean, Whole Foods and Trader yeah. Joe's and a lot of these types of stores didn't exist when I was a kid. Um, it, it was not necessary for milk cartons to say no hormones, no injected antibiotics and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a change. Um, but we need to we need to kind of keep keep our foot on the gas. You with think that. it's feasible to? I know there's certain um, like economic brackets can afford, right? But a lot of mm -hmm. the purchases on the lower end are usually always uh, price based. Yeah. So they won't even look deep enough. Like what you just told me just <laughs> blew my mind. I'm like, well, wait, there's no two sides because I was leaning on a yeah yeah the grass one, and then you're like, no, the way the grass is growing is also an issue. So all of this information, I think that's the only way to make the shift, right? Through education, because right. not knowing we're going to go through maybe the cheaper option or the tastier option, right? Like not the actual one that's going to give us the most nutrients. A hundred percent of the time, the unhealthy option is cheaper. hundred percent of the time. hundred percent. Wow. Time. You hear that? A hundred percent. Right. Is it cheaper to go get a Wagyu grass-fed steak or is it cheaper to get uh, a burger at, at a fast food joint? The burger always. Right? And it's satisfying and it's filling and you can feed your whole family for $30, <laughs> right? Now, I, I like what, one of the points that you brought out was um, the consumer demand because the, the demand to create the product, to, to be able to have the enough meat for the demand, it puts pressure to maybe perhaps take certain shortcuts mm -hmm. to get the meat there quicker. So that's a, a solid point that if the consumer demand maybe said, hey, no, we can wait. We don't need all this at once because we talked about how much of an abundance we already have. Right. So if we could scale back a little bit, maybe less portions, everybody does their part, then we'd actually be consuming a lot better food. Right. In right. essence. Right? I mean, in general, right. All of us in the room. Do you think we eat too much? Yes. 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 Speaking for myself. <laughs> Speaking for myself. Guilty. I'm guilty. Sure. We all yeah. do. I mean, I'm guilty of myself. I'm like an emotional eater. Like, I, I, I noticed that. Like, I treat myself. What? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like I'm like I'll take a trip to a place for the food. Like what? like think about that. My my ancestors are like rolling over the grace right now. It's like I, th I think that's a word for that foodie. <laughs> American. Yeah. That's, that's, that's word, an American yeah. a phenomenon. Yeah. You know we so I was just talking to somebody earlier today. It was a, a patient, and we were talking about alcohol consumption. Right. Uh, we're talking about liver disease and alcohol and the impacts of alcohol. And um, we got to talking and I said, you know, when I was in training, we were told that two to three alcoholic drinks a week is acceptable. That's that's fine. More than that is too much mm -hmm. from a liver standpoint. And now, uh, most recently, it's completely changed. Now the answer is zero. Alcohol is a toxin. And zero is the number that we should be at. Any alcohol is a toxin to the liver. And 
depending on what other stuff your body or your liver is dealing with, the level of, of impact where you kind of cross that threshold into liver inflammation and fatty liver and things like that, that varies person to person. But if, if alcohol is a toxin, which it is, then the answer is how much of that do you want? It's poison. Right? Wow. But we live in a society where, you know, I happen to not drink. It's, you know, it's a religious thing uh, as a Muslim. But um, what do you do when you get a promotion at work? Drink. You drink. What do you do when you graduate high school or college or whatever? You yeah. Know, you tend to drink. Um, somebody passes away, a loved one. You're going to drink. Right? It has socially become intertwined with every emotion. Right? You're going to drink when you're sad. You drink when you're celebrating. You drink when it's just, it's constant birthdays and just yeah, going out. Every family event. I, I, yeah. Every family event is like that. And when you stop, you actually, there's, there's some tension there mm-hmm. because they want to offer you the drink. And when you deny it, what's wrong with you? Like, what do you mean? Well, if the three of us go out and if I'm not drinking or I'm drinking, what is this, LaCroix, right? Mm-hmm. Jane you're going to be a little self-conscious about how many <laughs> drinks you're drinking. You will. It's a little awkward. It's yeah. a little weird. You're the only one. You're like, hmm. And if you're a little buzzed and I'm not, and it's awkward for me. It and is. It, it just becomes this thing. And so there's this underlying kind of pressure to drink in our society, so much so that our kids cannot wait to turn 21. Most of them don't wait till they're 21, but yeah, they yeah, cannot yeah. wait they till cannot. they turn 21. And that is the number one thing that they want to do. Right. And, and how many of us as dads or as parents will take our boy to the bar at 21 to get our first drink together? So now you've ingrained this memory with alcohol, with your father. Like these are just, Jeez, just things that yeah. we do. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I hate to you know, sound like I'm bashing no, us I'm as a culture. No, I'm glad you're bringing it up. But no, these are the types of things that have little impacts on society in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in our country that we don't realize. Because if everybody is in the same water, then we are, we are not in tune with the temperature of the water anymore. Because we're all in it. We're, we're just sure. unconscious. And so a lot of... Um, a lot of this comes from like traveling overseas in other countries because you get a different perspective. And if you spend a little time with people, they start to open up about their views of America and Americans mm. and how we live. And some of it's great. A lot of it is great. Is it? But sometimes it's like they're, you know, they say things and I'm like, yeah, you're right <laughs> they're about right. That. You know, they're like, oh, we, we don't do that here. Like, you know, I was, stop me if I go too long, but no. uh, <laughs> I, I was in it. Spain. In in southern Spain in Granada, which is one of my favorite cities. If you haven't been, you should go. It's in the the province uh, in Spain is called Andalusia. And so uh, we were in Granada. My children were younger. They were taking a nap in the hotel room. And this was summer. It was very hot, but it was in the afternoon. So I, I had a hat on and I got a Coke Zero, which is one of my vices, diet soda. <laughs> and um, I just went out walking around the streets and it was siesta time. Things were kind of slow. A lot of stores were closed. You know, people kind of take a break Hmm. in the afternoon. And so I see this little um, restaurant with chairs and tables out on the sidewalk. Just looks like a cool place. Tapas. And so they've got like this menu of stuff. And I'm looking at it. They've got like patatas bravas and meatballs and stuff. And I'm like sold. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So I sit down. I get a table. I'm by myself. I order like three or four things. Little plates. And I'm sitting there and next to me, I overhear people talking medicine. Like I hear a couple, yeah. like, <laughs> I hear, like I hear, I hear Spanish, okay. but I hear EKG or ECG. Uh. And I'm like, <laughs> and I, <laughs> perked you know, up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, so my ear perked up. And so I, I looked over and uh, what, the guy who was sitting with his back towards me had a stethoscope hanging over his shoulder. And there's three other guys and they're just sitting at the table and they're like laughing and they're talking and they're having a good time. And I just kind of noticed, and I think I just looked over for a second and then I, you know, went about my thing. I didn't want to be a weirdo staring at these people. Um, the guy gets up and comes over and kind of taps me on the shoulder. And he says, uh, he says, are you, uh, are you traveling? 
And, you know, I had like this Panama hat on and like cargo shorts. Like, I looked like <laughs> the only thing tourist. missing was a camera <laughs> okay. hanging from my neck. Like that's the only thing missing. It. And the it famous was, fanny pack yeah. Yeah. of a traveler. <laughs> Very obviously a traveler, right? And I said, yeah, I'm from, I'm from the United States. And uh, so another guy gets up from the table, picks up my stuff my plates and takes it over to his table. This guy, while I'm sitting in the chair, grabs my t chair and drags it over <laughs> to his table. And he says, you cannot eat alone. You have to sit with us. And I was like, man, it's like so cool. Right. And then you tell them what you did. And, and so just... we start talking. <laughs> yeah, we start talking and they're like, where are you from? I'm like Los Angeles. And, oh, what do you do? And I said, you know, I noticed you guys were at stethoscope. I'm a doctor from the United States. And they're like, oh my God, no way. You know? <laughs> And, so, oh, and cool. so we're talking now and they're telling, they're telling me about, so these four guys are doctors. They practice together. They have their own group practice. And he said every day, uh, Monday through Friday, whatever, five days a week, um, we shut down for two hours and we take lunch. And that's during the siesta part of the day. And he said, um, he said, and we always eat together. We always eat together, sometimes here, sometimes somewhere else, or sometimes we'll, you know, one of our houses, like, we'll just go eat. And I'm like, that's fantastic. Like, you yeah. guys, I was like, first of all, who's at the clinic right now? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because I'm an American. The first thing. Yeah. I'm an American, right? And so uh, he's like, well, nobody, it's closed. And I'm like, lost revenue, no patients, <laughs> like Jesus poor quality Christ. of care. If somebody has an adverse outcome, like they're, you know, they call in that they need somebody in an emergency. They're like, well, there's the ambulances. And there's, <laughs> you know, his point was that we take a break and we do this together and we sit and we talk. We talk family. We talk about the clinic. We talk about life. We talk about all kinds of things. And um, it allows us to bond and we hang out together. And it's a complete break from work. And and then he said, we go back and I'm like, well, are you guys going to go back and be there till like 9, 10 at night? Because that's my MO. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they said, no, we're going to be there for another two, two and a half hours and then we're done for the day. And so that's just the way they live. And so it just, it was eye opening to me to see that, that these guys have, have this whole, we talk about work-life balance. Balance, yeah, yeah, yeah. But priority for them is they need to do this so that it makes them more effective at doing that, right? And I told them all about physicians in America and our burnout rate and how we have support groups for each other for all of the burnout that we, we encounter. And I, I pointed out, we talked a little bit more about it. I said, you know, it wasn't um, our consensus in America, at least in medicine, is that burnout is not from seeing patients. We're not burnt out taking care of patients. That's actually rewarding. I think mm. I, I, most of my colleagues agree that that is the most rewarding part of the job is to take care of somebody. They come in with a problem, you try to help solve it. Um, it's the administrative burden. It's all the stuff that healthcare insurance companies make us do mm -hmm. and our employers, for those of us who are employed, what the things, the hoops we have to jump through and the paperwork and the prior authorizations and getting medications approved and figuring out how to how to call pharmacies to get things done that really aren't a part of a doctor's day to day but we're forced into these roles where we have to do it and so when you add that as a layer on top of patient care it detracts from your ability to do that properly but it also takes away from your mental health and from your ability to kind of focus on what's important um and they don't have to deal with that there. I mean, there's obviously there were, they had some niggles and things that they were worried about or complaining about. But to me, it seemed like the, the focus is on wellness. Mm. And, um, and the other thing that struck me is like two of these guys were smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Interesting. And so a lot of people smoke in Europe, man. Like you guys, yeah. if you've been to Europe. Is it a fool, like a, a, it's a culture there? Or is it just that group of uh, individuals that have this way of No, life? just everywhere on the street, you see people smoking. It's a very common thing. Like it's the way life here was in the 70s, the 60s and 70s, where everybody smoked. Um, there's that famous kind of clip where uh, after, you know, JFK was assassinated and Walter Cronkite was reporting that he had passed away, there was a cigarette burning on set like on on camera like, oh, that's like you how, can see the yeah mm -hmm. like you can oh, see the smoke man. right um so my point is that you look at studies looking at health and wellness and how people live 
And it's it's amazing that there are places where people have unhealthy lifestyles like that, like smoking, drinking, but they live longer and they have a happier life. But it's the the common thread is interpersonal relationships. Mm-hmm. Right. So to bring it full circle, like the yeah. way that how many close kinships and friendships do you maintain on a daily basis? You know, uh, we have a lot of friends. I have a lot of people that I consider friends. How often are we actually on the phone? How often are we yeah. actually getting together? How often are we actually making the effort to connect and talk? Right. Um, I think we're we're so busy in the day to day, the rat race and society forces us to do that. Right. That's what yeah. we value as a culture. So if you value that, then you will pay the price for that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> no. <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. Drop the mic. <laughs> wow. All right. Thank you. <laughs> That's our show. <laughs> Good luck. I know. Wow. You really shed light on, on just something that I just, I don't think people are conscious about it. Like, yeah, you're right. You're right. We supplement that with just the grind. Right. We, it's, it's a badge of honor. Yeah. Right. It's a You're badge right. of honor. In medicine, it is a badge of honor to work hours and hours and hours and hours without a break and to never say no and to always see the extra patient and to always go out of our way. In training, we are trained this way. Uh, In fact, the bad doctors are the ones that say, I, yeah, I'm tired. I've, I've kind of hit my limit. I've, I've seen my patients and I'm, I'm good. You're, you're, uh, you're rewarded. Or always, and I, I use medicine because I'm familiar with it, but I think this is in, in, in a lot of yeah, fields. I, mean, board, I talk yeah. to my friends who are lawyers, they'd say the same thing, putting in the hours, billable hours, and that comes above all else. You miss your kids' events, you miss some of them, miss the births of their children. I mean, all these things happen, and we are taught to, to be proud of that. You're right. We need to take more breaks, more siestas. That's right. right. You're that, right. That really um, helps. Um, one of, one of the things that, that you brought out that was very, very interesting to me personally is the importance of just sitting down and eating. How something so small, so it, it kind of, it's kind of taken for granted, really. I mean, when was the last time we, we sat around, even as a family, maybe to eat together, right? Or let alone with a friend. How often do you do that? Um, it just gets, because those bonds are really bonded even more when you break bread with somebody when you eat with somebody, when you can let your hair down, when you can talk, have those conversations. Uh, Some of the things that, I mean, we weren't eating, but just talking to you in the chair, having um, access to your knowledge and and your advice and just your willingness to to help me with my struggles uh, was something that really, I think bonded us a lot more. It taught me how to view taught me how to view food. You taught me about those oils to stick, and what to stay away from. I believe you recommended uh, um, coconut oil. And I still, if I am going to cook something, that's what I use. But that started from a conversation. Mm-hmm. Those conversations, I think, help alleviate stress, right? Because the, what you mentioned about burnout, I think that, the not, if you're burnt out, what's, that means you're highly stressed. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we all know that stress can cause a lot of damage. I mean, what are some of the things that you see stress cause just from a doctor's perspective. Well, so at a blanket level, stress causes inflammation and oxidative damage to your cells, right? We know that. Now, the way that manifests is different for different people because any tissue in the body, any organ in the body can be the victim of inflammation and oxidative stress, right? We always think of cancer as kind of an extreme example of that. And cancer is caused by cellular damage, nuclear damage and cellular injury and inflammation. And that's what uncontrolled causes that. Heart disease is caused by the same thing. Diabetes caused by the same thing. These are all stressors, right? So when you talk uh, earlier, when you were talking about fasting, when we discussed that, um, there's there's no way to reverse aging. The way that we want, like there's no Benjamin Button for most of us, right? Yeah. But we can certainly slow down inflammation and cellular aging. And there's even like, you know, there's ways people will measure your telomeres and kind of your your true age versus your your numerical age. Right. Whoa. So I'm 45, 
if you were to look at my cells and say, well, you're actually aging like a 65 year old, there's people like that. And there's also people that are kind of, you know, a little bit younger than my actual chronological age. Um, so the ways that we can go about slowing it are sleep. So sleeping seven to eight hours a night seems to be the best range. Less than seven, the outcomes are worse. More than eight, the outcomes are worse. So it seems like for most people, seven to eight hours seems to be the best window consistently. Um, not only consistently, but your hours should be consistent too. Like you go to bed at this time, you wake up at this time, right? That has a big impact. Shift workers, people who work at night and sleep during the day do worse and they have more adverse health outcomes and they die earlier than those of us who sleep at night and work during the day. So think about that the next time wow. you want to take a job that pays you more because you're going to take the night shift. There is a cost for everything, right? Um, uh, fasting. So fa so the pr I always explain this to patients like this. The process of eating and digesting is a pro-inflammatory process. So as long as you are eating or digesting and metabolizing, metabolizing, your liver is doing its job, clearing toxins from the food that you eat, your GI tract is functioning, your pancreas is making insulin, right? Um, your kidneys are filtering out water and urine. So all of these things are happening, and these are active inflammatory processes in the body. The process of eat, releasing toxins from the foods that we eat, which is inevitable, it's in everything, right? That is creating oxidative stress and damage that your body then has to combat. So your liver is producing glutathione and other antioxidants, um, vitamin C, vitamin E, these types of things are antioxidants. So all of this is trying to combat the inflammatory process from, from eating. So that then tells you that if you eat less and less frequently, that's less inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, the air we breathe. How much carbon, how much smog, how much stuff is in the air that we're breathing, right? So you think about downtown LA, downtown New York, or you think about a field in Iowa, right? Who's breathing Green the better oxygen, air, yeah. right? Yeah. So things like that. So it's important not to kind of get frazzled and be like, oh my God, I need to be in a bubble and wrap it, you know, like I can't have the sun, can't, you know, right? So... Part of life is aging and living and enjoying your life. It's up to each of us to decide where we're going to draw the line, right? I choose not to smoke. Some people, I, I have patients who will say, I don't care that I'm going to die. I love smoking. I love my cigarettes. I'm not going to quit. You've made that choice. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's conscious. I can politely say, don't blow that smoke in my face, <laughs> yeah. but you yeah. do you. Right. Yeah. So, um, again, this comes back to empathy and judgment and I don't know what they're going through and what stressors yeah. they have. And it's not my job. Right. My job is to be as supportive and empathetic as I can to my fellow man. Right. In hopes that others will do the same for me. Um, so anyway, so we talked about sleep. We talked about fasting. Um, cause if you're not fasting, there's so many benefits. I could give a whole lecture on it. Um, if you are in a fasting state, not only are you not producing oxidative stress and cellular injury and inflammation, you're doing the reverse because that is when your body is repairing itself. So there's intermittent fasting and then there's prolonged fasting. And prolonged fasting is kind of like three, five, seven day fasts with just water where you're just drinking water and you're not eating anything. By doing that, I think they said at the instead of five to seven day fast, by the end of that, every cell in your in your immune system is completely regenerated and new. You have an entirely new immune system in that process because when you're not actively trying to fight inflammation, it's repair time, and so your body is repairing itself, um, which also is part of sleeping. Right? We can't eat while we sleep, uh -huh. and so you're sleeping. And then on top of that, if you're not eating, you're in a fasting state, and that's where the repair happens. And from a neurologic standpoint, um, you, so our, you know, uh, Alzheimer's dementia is, is characterized by neurofibrillary tangles and tau protein, T-A-U, tau protein. 
build up in your brain. That's the one thing that we find on autopsy um, in Alzheimer's patients after death, right? So it turns out, um, uh, I read this in a study, that when you are sleeping, your body, your brain is able to clear out tau protein. And if you don't sleep and you don't get sleep consistently, that tau protein is cemented. It's there. And so that was shocking to me because, you know, in my line of work, uh, especially through training, you go without sleep for long periods of time. And that's just kind of a part of life. And you look at jobs where people don't get adequate sleep, right? And you look at what it does to you and the risk of Alzheimer's, right? Margaret Thatcher in England, she died of Alzheimer's. Um, which is also incidentally, you guys know, you, we talk about former U.S. presidents. Like you look at them when they go into office. Yeah, when they come that's out. a great example. And it's, <laughs> it's not even aging. It's like a father and a son. Yeah, like, it's yeah. Like you're right. You're right. You're right. right. Like Obama when he started. Yes, that's, that's, and then yeah. Obama when he finished. Right. Uh, Clinton, like all of them, uh, you know. So anyway, sleep has a lot to do with it. So, so if you're sleeping. And if you're fasting, then you're really reaping the rewards of repair and regeneration from a neurological level to a metabolic level. Um, it, it helps everything. Um, the third thing is uh, resveratrol, which is the enzyme that's found in uh, red wine, and it comes from grapes. And uh, they always remember they say red wine is good for you. It's not really. Uh, the amount of red wine you would have to yeah. drink to get the resveratrol. Four bottles in. <laughs> Jesus. Right. Uh, People are still trying. People are still trying. <laughs> You'll be seeing a liver specialist before, yeah. you, before, you, before get you get the benefits. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so so uh, I, take, I take capsules. So there's concentrated mm -hmm. resveratrol. Um, and you, you, you know, you, I get it on Amazon and, and you just take that. So resveratrol. Um, does seem to slow aging to some degree. Um, but yeah, these are these are kind of the ways that we that we can really combat some of the stresses that we we come across. So uh, from a fasting standpoint, what we talked about is the optimal window, right? We're still there's some debate about what's the optimal mm -hmm. duration and what's the optimal number of days in a week. So I I can say it's not a good idea to do it every day. So your body is designed to protect itself and fat is our savings account. And the last thing the body wants to do is dip into savings, yeah. right? We would like our body to dip into savings, <laughs> right away. Like burn it, <laughs> yeah. burn it, right? Let's eat the muscle. <laughs> right. Um, so there's two currencies in the body. There's the glucose currency. You think of cash and credit. Mm -hmm. There's glucose and there's triglycerides. Those are the two currencies in the body. Um, and if you're always using one currency, then the machinery for the other currency kind of gets rusty and you don't, you know, it's not as readily. You've heard the keto flu yeah. that people get. Uh -huh. It's because you have lived in the glucose currency for so long that you're not used to burning triglycerides mm. and fat for energy. And so when you start doing that, it's like, it's a very groggy, painful process to go through that until you get adept and you get good at it and then you can you can do it a little more readily. So if you eat a meal now, you're going to spend the next 4 hours metabolizing that meal. And that's glucose. You're still in the glucose currency. Okay. So 4 hours you ate let's let's just say you ate a burger and and a salad or whatever, you're going to metabolize, you're going to use some of that glucose for energy immediately. You're going to store some of it as glycogen. Glycogen is stored in the muscles and the liver. And once your glycogen stores are full, think of the deep freezer once it's full, okay. what are you going to do with that extra energy? It's going to be fat. It's going to be stored as fat, right? Yeah. So that's four hours. But now I'm hungry again because it's been four hours since I ate. So I'm likely to eat again, right? So not only have I not burned anything, but I haven't even gotten metabolized all of what I ate the last meal because I stored some of that as fat and, and the glycogen stores are full. If you don't eat at four hours, then your body will start to burn glycogen for energy. Glycogen is stored in the muscle and liver, remember. And so you're going to spend the next eight to 10, maybe even 12 hours burning glycogen. 
So you're like 16 hours from your last meal. On average, these are average numbers. Yeah. And you haven't even burned any fat yet. But we're starving, right? <laughs> Gee, uh -huh. And so if you don't eat at 16 hours, chances are for most of us, you're going to be burning fat at that point. Because then the body's like, okay, <laughs> I have nothing else, no gas to run the glucose machinery. So I guess I have no choice but to dip, dip into, into savings. The savings. So then you start burning <laughs> fat. Yeah, we all, we all so you start burning fat for energy. You get a couple hours of fat burning and then you break your fast, right? Um, and so you've gone 18 hours. So I like to tell people, if your goal is to try to drop a little bit of weight and gain from the benefits of fasting, 18 hours is really a good number as opposed to 16, because you're kind of guaranteeing a little bit of fat, fat burning and lipolysis in that process. So why wouldn't you do that every day? Because remember, your body is designed to protect itself, right? It's a survival instinct. If my, if I, if my body knows he only feeds me once every 24 hours or every 18 hours or whatever, it is going to learn to conserve as much energy as possible. So your heart rate slows, hair and skin, hair and nail growth slows, skin turnover slows, sperm production slows, heart rate, breathing, respiratory rate, everything slows down because your body is trying to expend as minimal energy as possible. And because I'm tired, I'm less likely to get up and do vigorous exercise or activities because I'm like, have the energy. right? I mean, for us, again, as a Muslim, this happens in Ramadan because we fast in Ramadan. I start out the day often thinking, well, I'm going to work out and I'm going to do this. And, yeah. and then like midway through the day, I'm like, I'm just like watching the clock. <laughs> waiting to like, I mean, this is, that's, that's the reason, right? So what you want to do is keep your metabolism up by changing the rules. And so a couple days a week, you want to not fast and you want to make sure you eat during the time that you don't normally eat. So. When I'm doing uh, the fasting, I'm doing intermittent fasting from 6 p.m. until about 12.30, 12, 12.30 the next day, which means I never eat breakfast. Yeah. So if on days where I'm not fasting, I make sure to eat breakfast, throw the body for a loop. Yeah, so the body right? adjusts. Right. And so often what I get from patients is, you know what? I started intermittent fasting. I lost 5, 7, 10 pounds, but now I'm not losing any more weight. And then I, I almost always tell them, don't fast, go eat a burger now. Why a burger? It's actually a great blend of carbs, fat, and protein. <laughs> really? I've <I'm laughs> never tastes, and it a doctor good, saying this. Okay. Right? <laughs> and it tastes good. And so you eat a burger, it jumpstarts your metabolism, give it a day, start fasting again in another day or so, and then you'll see the weight will start to come off again. So you do have to play mm. these little games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's fun. I mean, it it's, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a whole thing, right? And then you feel accomplished. You feel like you, you accomplished something. You're watching the weight come off. And by the way, your hemoglobin A1C is getting better. Your blood pressure tends to get better. You're looking better, you know, and then, of course, all the anti-inflammatory effects of fasting. So long-term intermittent fasting like that still has immune benefits and vascular benefits and all that stuff. Yeah, wow. thank you for <laughs> for that information. I mean, you said it so eloquently, and um, you know, just just from our viewer standpoint, you know, they've seen kind of my journey over the past few years. Yeah. Uh, they've seen, you know, following your advice, and I'm and I'm so grateful because it's like having you in the chair again. Because you look like you anti aged, man. You, <laughs> you looked older three, four years ago, one hundred percent. Absolutely, and, and and there's uh there's footage. <laughs> you know, to prove it. <laughs> and I'm Roll the clip. <laughs> Roll the clip. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know. It's so true. So it's not that we're just saying, hey, you know, um, that was one of the reasons why, uh, of the many reasons that I wanted to have you on, because you would have ex you explained it so much better than me. I would have just been like, yeah, just fast. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, it works. Well, that's what works. And I mean, literally when they ask me, I'll tell them, yeah, you know, just doing a little fasting, and, you know, find out what works for you. Thank you for describing it so eloquently and breaking it all down for of course, us. Of course, I'm happy to do it. Yeah, happy this is so something much that sense. It, it does. So it's much logical. Hey, and as a side effect, you're consuming less resources, you're eating less, yes. you know, right? So all of these other things, yeah. which are all good things. Yeah. All good you're things. better for the planet. 
We could we fat. could wait for that uh, properly grown meat. Yeah. <laughs> when you fast, right? You got time. <laughs> and it's not that t- um what you said from six to twelve thirty. Mm-hmm. If you really think about it, it's not terrible. Well, because you're sleeping anyway. Yeah. So you want to use that time, right? Um, and your busiest time for most of us is in the morning when you're doing. You know, for me, get up in the morning, get dressed, get ready for work, shower. You know that whole process and you go to work and you're kind of just catching up, catching up. And before you know it, it's the middle of the day. I mean, yeah. noon, noon comes very quickly. And, um, and often I'll kind of play the game where I'm like, oh, let me see another hour. Let me see if oh, I can just push another yeah, hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, so I kind of make it a little, a little game. Look, you yeah. get a lot of, fi- I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you, no. you get a lot of physical benefits, but also there's a lot of mental benefits. There's mental clarity. There's energy that, that comes from fasting. Um, I've been able to just focus a little bit better. It just improves your overall feeling. Like I just feel so much better. You get more energy. So mm. the hormonal response, right? Growth hormone, endorphins, catecholamines, like all of the stuff that really gives you more energy. So growth hormone, for example, rises during a fast. And it if you're doing a prolonged fast, it actually peaks at day three. And so growth hormone is not just for growth, it's also repair right? Um, as a side effect, it blocks the body from breaking down muscle. So when growth hormone has peaked, you, your body is kind of forced into burning fat because it's not going to burn muscle. But also um, during, during the night when you're asleep, growth hormone rises, especially in kids. Again, you're not eating while you're sleeping. So if you notice, for those of us who have kids, your kid's when do you notice the growth is overnight when they get up in the morning. Like I explicitly remember that myself, but also with my kids is like the PJ pants came up just a little bit, right? Growth happens when you're sleeping. So all of this stuff, like it's all good stuff. Yeah. When you don't eat, it's the best time ever, right? It's the best, the healthiest way. Just don't yeah. eat. You're like, you're like, I'm just never going to eat again. Dude, We've been doing benefits, it all wrong. The benefits that... I mean, even now I'm thinking I'm, if somebody is stressed, I think maybe that would be a form of a solution, right? It is. It absolutely is. Absolutely is. When you are, if you view all of disease and stress as inflammation, right? That's the blanket statement. Uh-huh, yeah. Is you're looking at inflammation and what are the ways that I can decrease inflammation and is that going to be helpful or not? And the answer is it will yes. be helpful no matter what you're going through. Um, but we tend to do the opposite. When you're stressed and you're mm. worried, you're not sleeping well, you're tossing and turning, you tend to eat ice cream and stuff. You know, not only are you eating, but you're eating stuff you shouldn't be eating yeah. because it's soothing. It's short term on the, on the tongue. It's yeah. soothing because you're trying pleasure. to self-soothe, um, but you're actually the cascading process, right? Of stress. And so you're, co- you're making the situation worse by right. doing exactly that. That That's, makes you feel good in that second or that it only lasts very, very short amount of time. That pleasure. Right. Then it's stomach aches, <laughs> you know, be depressed, and especially sugar and carbs. When you eat sugar and carbs, remember insulin rises, then it comes back down and then you crave more. And so that's why you tend to eat more. And the interesting thing, and this was a study looking at diet soda, um, which is uh, people who drink more diet soda tend to have more metabolic syndrome and more carbs, more carb intake, and they tend to gain weight. And you're thinking, well, it's sugar free. It's calorie free. Why would you do that? Yeah. It's because it still tastes sweet. And that means it is still probably making you crave more sweets and more carbs. Wow. So <laughs> even though you're drinking diet soda, you tend to look for like you don't realize it, but you're going for things that are a little more carby. Yeah. The and, label and is so, not, uh, it doesn't translate to your body. Your body doesn't care right. about the label, <laughs> what right. the label says, right? It's still sweet. I'm right. still going to go through that same process. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating stuff, isn't it? It really Absolutely. is. Yeah. That fascinating stuff. Uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> All right. This is over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, oh my man. God. So th- there you have it, South Bay. Uh, I'm sure you yes. get a gem out of I mean, if you oh, didn't pick up one, two, or three things, I mean, unbelievable. Oh, no, we're not done yet. We're just, we're, really? we, please pay attention. I'm sure that, that uh, I know I've benefited tremendously. I know Eddie now, you know, 
with, with everything that he had. I know his mind's processing. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you know, I've, I've had this, I've had the luxury of having this conversation with, with him before and the luxury of listening to him or, you know, following through on, on the suggestions that were given. And they were so just, just exactly how they were given. These are suggestions, South Bay. By no means are we trying to say you have to do this. These are right, suggestions. And um, I took medical su- data back. Yeah, I know, right? right? Okay. <laughs> your doctor. Make sure okay. this is right for you. <laughs> it is, yeah, but I mean, you have in me an example of uh, following uh, Dr. Omir Dean's advice, and it went really good for me. So um, definitely, let's 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 uh, change it up a little bit. Let's right. let's talk about some fun stuff because uh, you just got back from Egypt. Mm. How long ago did you get back? Is it I think it's been, been a week? Two weeks. two weeks now? Two weeks. Uh, I came back on the 5th, January 5th. It's yeah. fantastic. It was a two week trip. Um, we're trying to take, I'm trying to kind of a couple times a year take an international trip uh, with the kids. I'm realizing that I've only got a couple years left with them before they go off to college and then yeah. schedules don't match up and breaks don't match up and, you know, things happen. People get busier. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to kind of do some international travel just because I think of all the things that we've done in our lives, travel has probably been the most like bang for your buck, like the amount that you learn. And I, I say this again to, uh, as, as Americans, we are on this high horse. I feel like it's the greatest country on earth. It's the best place. We got the strongest military. Everything's just fantastic. Right. Why would we ever leave and go anywhere else? Right. Um, again, other points of view, being empathetic, learning from others, kind of seeing the impact on the rest of the world. I think all these things are fantastic. And plus just the fun of it, the fun of, you know, experiencing other cultures and food and religions and kind of the way other people live. So my advice would be go somewhere that is as different from your way of life as possible. (sighs) And, and don't fall into the trap of kind of looking for familiar stuff like don't go to Cairo, Egypt and eat McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Go to Cairo, Egypt and eat at Abu Tharik, which is like uh, Abu Tharik has their, they specialize in, in this Egyptian dish called koshari. And so koshari is a mix of, there's rice, there's lentils, there's like some macaroni. Um, and then it's covered in, you put a little vinegar and you put some uh, tomato sauce and some fried onions, some crispy onions on it. And you just kind of mix it up and it's just, it's so delicious. And this place just specializes in it. And we're like, well, this is a delicacy and this place specializes yeah. in it, let's uh, go. No brainer. No brainer. And so yeah. we went and it was just a great experience and, and there's tons of places like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, travel's been, been fantastic. And I would say everyone should be in a country where you are the minority where nobody speaks your language, where they eat different food, where they don't look like you, it's important to experience what that feels like because you learn so much from it. You learn how to negotiate and talk to people and how to, you know, how to get what you need. It's not that easy, but it's a lot of fun and it brings out the best in people, right? Like people, I've never been lost anywhere where nobody wants to help me. Like people will come to your aid. They will walk you to where you need to go. Like that, that really, you know, that human interaction yeah, yeah, yeah. is really great. Um, so coming back to Egypt, uh, two weeks, we did a 10 day tour with a friend of mine, um, Munir Sheikh with Bayan. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, Islamic seminary school, but they have tours that they do. So every, you know, three or four times a year, they will choose a different country and say, we're going here X number of people first come first serve. And so we, we usually sign up because it's just always been a fantastic experience. We've done Morocco, Turkey, Malaysia, Bosnia, Spain. Um, they've done tours to China. There's a Holy land tour. Um, the next tour I think is in Iran, which I can't go to because it's too close to Egypt where we just came back from Egypt. I can't take time off to go. Um, all these cool places, Thailand, like all these cool places. So it was a tour of Egypt. We landed in Cairo, um, really saw the whole country, went to Giza, Alexandria, Luxor, the Valley of the Kings, um, did a three day cruise on the Nile river, which is amazing. Um, 
This is like the Nile River, right? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like there's biblical stories about this, right? About Moses and the Nile River and stuff. And just to be there is, is very, very cool. Um, and so we got a chance to see that, uh, experience the culture, meet the people, eat the food. Uh, it was a fantastic trip. Wow. wow. Yeah. What was the weather like? Uh, it was very similar to how it is here right now. It didn't rain. But it was like slightly chilly, maybe in the mornings or evenings. Not too, not too bad. Like you, this was fine. The sweater's fine. It wasn't snowing or anything. Nice. But now's the time to go. I wouldn't go in the dead of summer. No, it's like <laughs> it's like 120, yeah. 130 degrees. How do you book that? Do you like do you have a? Um, so I would rec. You could either go with a tour. So like Gate One Travel, and there's a lot of tour companies that do tours there. But there's also um, you could just call up a travel agent, or you could do your own thing and just kind of go book a ticket, go over there. Um, I think it's probably easiest to book a tour with somebody you know and trust, or somebody who's gone. Yeah. I'd just like to take this moment to acknowledge our sponsor, Finley's Tree and Land Care. They've been serving the South Bay for 45 years, and recently are expanding into the Orange County area. They have certified arborists that can take care of any design that you may have. If you call now, we have a special promo code designed for this podcast. Mention SBC20 and get up to 20% off. Finley's, it's a name and company you can trust. Yeah, you know, when traveling, uh, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you when you got back from Egypt was like, you know, I'm, my concern is always like, okay, well, man, I got to pick the right clothes. What should I wear? Like, what, what do I, put? Oh, man, yeah, you know, you get so caught up into wanting to take your style somewhere else. And, and then that fight between what, what would look right or what have you, but you know, I'm, I'm curious, what, what were some of the things that, what were some of the items you picked? So wear? you could have fun with it. Right. So, uh, I remember when we went to Morocco, uh, this was just before the pandemic, 2019, came back like January 2nd of 2020. And then we're like hearing about this virus. And then we went into lockdown in March, right? So um, in Morocco, uh, part of the trip, I spent uh, three days camping in the Sahara Desert. No electricity, like just, wow. right? I had a camel and I had, I, I wore like the traditional garb with the turban and stuff. And I was just... Wow. You know, kicking it in the desert as one does. As one does. <laughs> when in Morocco. And so, right? And I had a blast. It was, it, was, it was amazing. It was so cool. It's so comfortable and like it's airy and like for like that climate, it makes total sense. Mm. Um, so anyway, but I did that there. I was thinking about in Egypt, I was like, oh, it'd be kind of cool to wear, you know, but really in Egypt, everybody's wearing what we're wearing right now. It's just, you know, that's just what everybody's wearing. Um, so. I, uh, my kids make fun of me because when we travel, I tend to look homeless. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of like, I'm getting away from my world. Right. So okay. I stopped shaving, like I'm wearing sweats and t-shirts and my t-shirts are like my favorite people call me dad. Right. <laughs> okay. They hate that stuff. Right? They hate it. They're embarrassed to be around me, which just makes me want to do it more. Right. <laughs> And so, uh, so now they're like 14 and 15 years old. They're going to be 15 and 16 next month. Um, you know, always focused on looking fresh, like the cleanest sneakers, like, you know, you know and, and there's dad who's embarrassing as hell <laughs> because he's like wearing track suits and stuff. Right. You wore track and I wore track <laughs> suits the entire trip. <laughs> like I took 10 track suits <laughs> no. on this trip. I had, I had one pair of jeans. That I wore one day or whatever, but it was tracksuits the whole way. And they're embarrassing tracksuits. I get it. But to me, it's like, I'm having fun with it. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, pink. I'm going to buy those. Oh, it's like these like teal colored tracksuit. I bought yeah. that, right? Um, and so I wore these on the trip and these guys were so <laughs> embarrassed to be around me. Like just every morning was like, oh my God, I, cannot, yeah. I don't want to be seen in public with you, right? So I had fun with it and it's super comfortable. The thing is, I looked like a tourist, right? Like this, <laughs> he's rolling out. around Egypt in track suits. It, it, yeah, it was obvious that I was a tourist. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that. And so, <laughs> what, what, kind of, what kind of activities did you do uh, in uh, in, um, in Egypt? So a lot of our time was kind of spent looking at like pyramids, tombs, kind of historic stuff. It's just 
well, think about it. There's centuries of history yeah, in Egypt. Yeah. Like this goes back before the Romans, before the Persians, like all of that. So it's just ancient, ancient stuff. And um, and so a lot of time was spent looking at these temples and and kind of these their way of life. Um, and so other than that, we did like you know that Nile cruise was a lot of fun. Uh, that was three days. We did. Um, ATVs. We rode ATVs behind the deserts and uh, behind the pyramids in Giza in the <laughs> desert. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> wow. And uh, I had some pictures with that. And one of my colleagues actually uh, is a local uh, doc here, pulmonary critical care, um, Makala Delta Will. And he, uh, he was there with his family. And so we actually ended up over overlapping for a few days. And so we hung out there and our, we, we all went ATV riding and stuff. Oh, cool. It was a lot of fun. From all the places in the world. Huh? We went the from Torrance and we ended up. <laughs> wow. It was super wow. cool. Odd. It was super cool. So we had a good time. In your tracksuit. In my tracksuit. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was in my tracksuit. I'm awesome. telling you. Awesome. I'm telling you. <laughs> There's the T-Hawk. <laughs> Can you imagine the, the people from far away? You yeah. just see him in the ATV. Yeah, he's, he's in a pink tracksuit <laughs> behind see. the pyramid. I, I shared some pictures with you guys, like with the kids and stuff. Yeah. They don't want to be in pictures with them. Like, it's very obvious. We're at this historic place and the kids are like, Did in you, the pictures, your, right? Your set has beautiful hair. It looks like he let it grow out a little longer to kind of hide him. Yeah, hide his, his, hide his eyes. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah, he's got a lot of swag. I could see how he would be like, come on, dad. You exactly. Know? It's it's that age. It's I'm getting age. advice from him. I'm right? like, what should I wear? He's like, you don't want to wear that shirt. You know? <laughs> awesome. You're gonna wear it with those. Why would you put on those shoes? Why would you? you know? <laughs> it's fun. I'm enjoying it. It's it's uh, really refreshing to know that despite everything that you give to our community, that you still find time to for your family and and have those memories that you create for them. Uh, you're gonna be laughing about those track suits for years and years and years, but. Those memories that you left with them are are, are forever, and uh, you yeah. know that's. I'm glad that you got to experience that. I'm I'm so grateful for that, and and for everything that you've shared with us. I mean, you've educated, uh, you've you've reinforced my some of the things that you've uh, given to me, and the, some of the things that I've been able to implement in my life. And you know, Eddie is really super intrigued, and he's got some great not ideas tonight. I know. <laughs> No, I'm definitely not. Eating. I'm. How could you? How could you? After mission you're, accomplished. Yeah, dude, you did it. I'm not even. I'm yeah. not. This isn't a facade. Like I'm not gonna eat tonight. Which is my girl's name. Oh, I, I can't do it. It helps to do this in groups. Uh, we were talking earlier. So um, there's colleagues of mine at work where we've gotten together groups of seven, eight people, and we'll just everybody's gonna do this together. And I'm kind of, you know, mm. we're on a group text and I'm coaching everybody through it. And we're, you know, can I, you know, I'm breaking my fast. What should I eat? And should I not eat? And what should I do? And, you know, so it's, oh. it's fun because it makes it like, because you, everyone has moments of weakness, yeah. right? Where you're thinking, okay, oh, maybe I'll not, fast. I'll break my fast. I'll do this tomorrow. But then you got a group of people that are doing it with you and they're all doing it. And so it'll kind of push you through. It takes a little while to get used to it. Mm. You know, I, I think give it a good week to get used to it. Once you're used to it, you'll actually feel hungry less and you'll get into the rhythm of it. Oh, and you do have to drink water. Be plentiful with the water when you're fasting. Okay. Every time you get some sort of craving or eating, tap drink in. Drink water. Yeah. Drink, I mean, you could chew ice if you want, but, <laughs> uh, but water is helpful. Okay. Yeah. Um, very, very helpful. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and it's not as difficult as we may think. It's it's because we've had we've been kind of programmed from such a young age, you know, yeah. like eat everything on the plate, three yeah. meals a day, you know, all, all these different Breakfast things. Breakfast the most important meal of the day. Right. Right. Who it, sold us that? <laughs> the industry. Yeah, the industry, yeah. Dude, so, how can they do that? How are they allowed to do that? <laughs> well, like I mean, now I feel <laughs> I feel bamboozled my whole life. We have been bamboozled. We've egg all egg. been bamboozled. Sunny side up. <laughs> <laughs> bro. That shouldn't even exist. Pancakes, waffles. Oh my Ooh, god, that's the destruction. You're eating bread, you're eating uh, pancakes. <laughs> yeah, that is traumatized. Traumatized. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine all the dude? This is just like me. And I feel like I have the time and the resources to find these uh, uh, this education, and I 
Mm, no, a little bit, but obviously I don't know enough. The majority of my my family, they don't they don't know about this. Like yeah, don't. most most people don't, right? Yeah. And, and the thing is that if you look back historically throughout history, um, I, I'm a big history buff. I I love world history. I studied world history, and um, it was always a sign of wealth and prosperity to be kind of chunky, to be a little over mm. you're well fed. Baller, you can afford baller it. alert. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. No, but that right? makes that makes sense socially. And it's, right? it's always kind of the poverty and kind of you're really skinny and you're really you know like that's that's always been the case. Mm. And um, and so interestingly, there's some villages around the world where tribes of people like it's a commonplace thing. Like when a woman is approaching marriage age. Like the whole village will plump them up, like you feed, you force feed them, and you really get them really. It, it's a cultural thing mm. because that's that's From an attractive birth. thing, uh -huh. yeah. So it's even today, it's not just historically, but yeah. um, you know, just when you start to really think about your actions and what you're eating and what you're doing and who is this benefiting and who's not benefiting and how is this hurting me, things kind of fall into a different bucket in your mind. Mm. But I think that we are just, you know, partially through advertising and lifestyle and kind of the things that we see on TV and just the way our society runs is very, um, it's capitalism driven, right? It's about sales. Yeah. It's about ratings. Revenue, it's yeah. about money and revenue. Um, and so the economy does best when we are spending, 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 right? And so how do we keep people spending? Well, keep them hungry. Keep them coming back for carbs and sugar, right? Um, and food, and then of course fashion and and these types of things. Just you know, not all of it's bad, but it's all stuff that we have to manage, right? Yeah, yeah. everything but is good in moder in moderation. So sugar is just it's not. Um, there's no nutritional value to it. Should it be treated like alcohol? I think it should. Um, I think that. Um, you know, arguably it causes damage to your liver and your pancreas and your body. I would argue the same as alcohol does. Mm. It doesn't mm. inebriate you always, but how many of us would deny that the sugar high that we see in children oh, yeah. and then the sugar crash that we see in children when it's a birthday party and they had cake and ice cream yeah. and cotton candy. And then what happens two hours later? <laughs> Who's throwing a tantrum? Yeah. Right. So, um, and adults are no different. We just mask it. Yeah. You know? Um, so there's no nutritional value to it. Wow. You, there is no carb, like a minimum carb that you need to eat per day. Think about that. You, you do need meat. I know I get a lot of flack for it. Some people are vegan, vegetarian, yeah, which, yeah. which is a choice that you then do have to compensate for because there are certain things you can only get through meat. Um, oh. but that's fine if you're doing that, but, um, you know, we need, we need, um, fats, right? You don't need carbs. You don't need sugar. There's nothing that you gain from it metabolically. Multi-billion dollar industries with that. <laughs> yeah. that's, now, that's having, having said that, I'm not saying yeah. never have a croissant, yeah. never have a piece of bread. Like I'm not saying that, but. When you understand that this is not a need for nutrition, yeah. it's a treat. Yeah. So treat it as a treat. I like that. Exactly. I like that. I like that. And now it, I just have to practice what I'm preaching. No, but I mean, <laughs> you know, saying part. it out to the world, I think at, at least it's, you're consuming it just by saying it. And you have to, if you're conscious at all and you're trying to improve at all, this has to make some sort of sense. It's got to resonate. Right. It, it definitely will take a little bit of time to process everything and then start to incorporate it into yourself, but it's not that difficult to do. And I think that's a great um, suggestion that you mentioned to do it in a group because mm -hmm. that you kind of keep yourself uh, motivated, you know, like if you right. have, you're feeling hungry, Hey guys, I'm feeling hungry. Even just expressing it and getting like a reinforcement, like, Hey, hang in there. Let's, you know, drink some water right now. You know, it's something small like that to get mm -hmm. you over that hump. Right. Uh, that's an excellent suggestion. And, uh, you know, take it from me. It's not impossible. It, uh, it's not as rigid as it may sound. It's And it's not like, oh, you got to do this and all this other stuff is bad. No, like you mentioned, finding that right balance, the moderation, but being consistent. Mm -hmm. If you're consistent with it, you'll reap the benefits. And, and it really, 
the drive isn't how you look. Really, my drive, my drive is how I feel. How I feel when I do this, when I'm going to eat this food, how am I going to feel? Right. And then eventually you practice that for a sustainable amount of time mm -hmm. and you're going to find the benefits. You're going to feel better. Yeah, looking better, it comes with the territory, but that's not the main focus because you could look better in a week if you do certain things, right? Mm -hmm. that, and it'll be unhealthy. You could, you could lose weight through a variety of different things that are going on right now. But if you do it naturally, you do it with a purpose and you do it with a strategy that's actually beneficial for your body, you're going to reap all the benefits. Right. Thank you for directing me in this way. I mean, I'm no, so grateful. I'm man. so You're grateful. Looking, looking good, feeling good. That's important. Thank you. That, that's a foreign uh, concept to many, at least for me. Eat for how you feel. Most of us, I just want to eat good stuff. Like, I don't, <laughs> I think that's the majority of people. Like, think about it. It sounds so simple and stupid in a way, right? Or you eat because of how you're going to feel. And it's true. Sometimes, very few times, I'll eat like um, seafood. Seafood makes me feel lean with energy. Oh, this is clean. But I never associate like, hey, man, that burger is not making you feel the same way. I never associate the two. I never make that connection. But that is how you should be thinking. How is this fool going to make you feel? And what kind of energy is going to give you to go and attack your day, right? To go and be productive or whatever it is you're going to do in the day. It's like, yeah. Yeah, we're, I think it's more, we're a little bit more programmed, at least personally for taste, you know, everything had a taste, uh, right? Taste, oh gosh, yeah, my mom, yeah, yeah. it tastes so good. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh man. I didn't even think about it, the nutritional value. It was right. always the taste. Oh yeah. mom, that tastes horrible. Here, have some liver. No, no, I don't want yeah. to, you know, but, but now, you know, how I view food is okay. What is this going to do for me? Um, okay. No, it's going to make me feel better. Yeah. It's a comfort food. Think about that expression, comfort, comfort food. food right. Yeah, it's going to make me feel comfortable for a little bit, but it's going to make me feel too comfortable where I'm not going to have the energy to get up and burn what I just ate. So how you view food is something that um, you, you helped me to really understand. And, and, and I'm, I'm positive that the South Bay will get so many gems from this. Uh, I'm so grateful to have spent this time with you, doctor. I mean, man, you're, you're uh, this was fun. I'm, I'm glad you came and, and, and you made it so easy for us yes. and so logical. And um, I'm, I'm even more motivated to continue. Yeah. Um, I'll be your, I'll be whoever support group wants to reach out to me and, and, and get together. If you guys want to do a fast, I'm with you guys. Um, please include me in the text. Those yeah. who have my number, I uh, would love to and would want to try it. Let's, let's do it yeah. together. I'm happy to help yeah. together. You include me. If you want me to oh, wow. help guide and coach, I'm happy to do it. You wow. motivate me too. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much for coming Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. South Bay. There you, there you have it. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We got, is that a standing note? I've never heard the standing note one. Oh, uh, that's awesome. <laughs>